Welcome to Square Notes, the Sacred Music Podcast. Your chance to learn about the teachings of the Catholic Church on sacred music, both in theory and practice. Through interviews, discussions, and music, your hearts and minds will be lifted up and better understand what it means to sing the praise of His glory. And now, your hosts, Peter Carter and Dr. Jennifer Donaldson. Hello, listeners, and welcome to Square Notes, the Sacred Music Podcast. Certainly anyone who's studied the piano has lived in the long shadow cast by Franz Liszt, the Hungarian virtuoso pianist and composer who lived from 1811 to 1886. If you've heard much of his life, it might be about his seemingly miraculous skill at the keyboard, his striking looks, or the fame and fortune that accompanied his early life. Perhaps, too, you may have heard his compositions, many people easily being able to recognize his Campanella etude or perhaps a Hungarian Rhapsody. On today's show, Dr. Jay Hirschberger, the president of the American Liszt Society, shares with us the growing sway of God's grace on Liszt's life, his story of conversion, his later years in fervent practice of his faith, his compositions about various Catholic topics and music for the liturgy, and even about his non-musical writings about theological issues of the day. A fantastic pianist and teacher in his own right, we're delighted to bring you this interview with Dr. Hirschberger. Thanks so much for joining me today, Jay. My pleasure, Jennifer. It's great to be here. So the story of Franz Liszt's life looks a lot like what many people experience in terms of God's grace working in their lives. He grew up Catholic. He lived a rather debauched life as a young person and then transformed by grace when a grave suffering was encountered later in life. Liszt lived all these things in a rather grand way, though, because of his fame and his influence. Can you tell us a little bit about Liszt's rise to fame and the accompanying quote-unquote lifestyle that went with it? Sure, I'd be glad to. What's interesting, and Dr. Alan Walker, who's probably the foremost biographer on Franz Liszt, makes this observation about any study of Liszt's life. In most composers' lives, the biography is very straightforward. You lay out the documents that tell the life, and then you make uh, and draw conclusions from that. On the other hand, in Liszt's life, he was so famous, so much was written about him, much of which is myth and legend, et cetera, that you kind of have to start backwards and work through all of the fame and fortune things that were written about him and then try to work backwards to separate those out to get a sense of how the life really was. And uh, I'll give you just one example of that. One of the great myths about Liszt's life is that he went around Europe peopling (laughs) the countries with his progeny. This is a patent myth, and we know that he laid claim to three children, all three of whom he had with uh, Countess Marie de Gaulle, who was his first uh, long-term partner in life. And he was never apologetic about the fact that those were his children. He took care of them from afar. His uh, mother actually raised them after he and and Caroline uh, split. Excuse me, uh, Marie de Gaulle. Caroline was his second long-term partner. He was very concerned about their well-being and very concerned about his paternity. Um, He wanted people to know that that these were his children. One of the famous myths concerns a a woman in Germany who very much did look like him. In fact, some people said that her uh, resemblance to Liszt was very, very striking. And uh, she was known as one of Liszt's, you know, daughters. It's a rather tragic story because at one point she was actually run over in a streetcar accident and crippled her. And for the rest of her life, it was really through this uh, alleged connection to Liszt that she was able to survive. And when she died and was buried, her gravestone says Liszt's last daughter. Unfortunately, if you go back and you examine the baptismal records of this woman— and go back nine months with three months on on either side, List was a thousand miles away in St. Petersburg. And unless he had the ability to bilocate, uh, (laughs) it is very certain that uh, she was not his biological child. 
But one has to go through and look at these things to try to see what is what on a case-by-case basis. So that's kind of an example of why his life is a little bit different in terms of trying to understand what he was all about. Certainly, the fame and fortune came very, very quickly after his uh, time with Czerny in Vienna, uh, and he began to do concerts. His fame began to spread. He was an extraordinarily strikingly handsome young man. And his pianistic abilities were really quite stupendous and and outstanding. Of course, he was very, very much influenced by uh, Niccolo Paganini, whose virtuosity on the violin was unparalleled. And he said to himself, Liszt did, when he first heard Paganini, he says, I want to be able to do that on the piano. Uh, So... He began this absolutely wonderfully famed career as a a pianist, and wherever he went, I mean, there was a lot of hullabaloo about him. So that rise to fame, of course, attracted all sorts of people to him, both the good and the bad, as you might Mm -hmm. imagine. But along the way, he was always of two minds. In fact, at one point later in life, he characterized his own existences that he felt like he was half gypsy, half Francescan. And uh, certainly the life sort of is played out that way in how he, on the one hand, was an extraordinarily worldly-minded human being who played to the audience. He was never shy about, you know, making certain that the audience knew who he was and what he was capable of doing. There are, of course, wonderful examples of piano duels. One of the famous ones in Paris was between he and Sigmund Talberg. Right. The critics, after the fact, basically said it was a draw, but certainly the partisans on each side said their partisan won. <laughs> <laughs> so Liszt's fame kept growing, and everywhere he went, people clamored to hear him play. And yes, there were many, many uh, women who really, in some ways, this is a maybe not a, a completely accurate analogy, but some people have said, you know, that List was sort of the Elvis Presley of the 19th century. <laughs> I'm not sure that that's absolutely <laughs> true, but you do have stories. Dr. Walker, in his wonderful biography, tells the story of a couple of women who actually fought over one of List's cigar butts. Not only did that happen, but whoever won, and I don't remember all of the details, but she used to wear uh, the butt in a locket close to her heart. But after several weeks, of course, it began to stink incredibly. And <laughs> nobody wanted to be around her. <laughs> you know, so. But interesting about his uh, fame is that he really wanted to take the piano to a new level of expressive height. And in many ways, he embodied the, the idea of the 19th century virtuoso as a heroic figure, but not only a heroic figure, but in some ways a a suffering hero that was easily misunderstood. And because all of the news reports and articles and reviews and musical magazine pieces that were written, both by friend and foe, he could not escape the consequences of all of that. It was very, very difficult. And it led to some real suffering on his part. And yes, he did have his way with the ladies. Interesting about that, and I think this will probably move into another subject as we as we move on, is that he, from a young age, was very, very serious about his Catholic faith. When he was a teenager, he had thoughts of going into the seminary and becoming a priest and being martyred for the faith. He had a very sort of almost ecstatic and fervent approach to his Catholic faith. His father, who had, of course, named him after um, St. Francis of Assisi, and had often taken him to the local monastery where they lived, really understood who List was. And he knew that probably being a priest was not going to be in his best interest and really did push him to pursue music. 
But at the same time, he also warned him that because of his abilities and his striking appearance, he was going to have difficulty with the ladies. Mm -hmm. And List, at various times in his years of travel, the years of virtuosity, if you might say, came upon and encountered the females who sometimes would throw themselves at him. And Sometimes he made mature decisions with regard to that, and sometimes he did not. His first long-term commitment was to Countess Marie de Gaulle, who was married to a very, very well-known and elite uh, person in Paris, Charles de Gaulle. But that marriage was not a well-matched marriage, and Marie tended to be aware of the fact that she was probably his intellectual superior because she was extraordinarily smart. She was also quite strikingly beautiful. Six feet of lava under a several feet of snow. <laughs> and she was quite the intellectual. And, of course, they took up together and actually ran off to Switzerland and eloped. It was very scandalous in Paris, of course. And their uh, relationship produced three children. Blondine was the oldest, then Cosima, and then finally Danielle. Liszt was a, a doting father to the three of them, although they were often traveling. And they left the three children in the care of Liszt's mother, Anna, in Paris. They were very, very well matched, the two of them, in terms of their intellect. And this is one of the things that really distinguished Liszt. He was not a mere sort of Don Juan kind of dashing lover. He really treated his female acquaintances with real respect because he treated them intellectually as equals. And this was true of Marie. It was also true of Princess Caroline. And they had lots of talks and, and they read philosophy and literature and they visited art museums and List was very much interested in these kinds of things. So it was really during this time of List's fame that he began to tire of the traveling. It was estimated that he probably in that period from the late 1820s or early 1830s, I guess I should say, all the way up until uh, the early 40s that he probably played a, th a thousand concerts at least and traveled across the face of Europe and into Russia uh, several times. But he began to tire of that because his heart was really in composition. He wanted to be a composer. And it was at that point that at age 35, he walked away from the concert hall as a traveling performing virtuoso and took up residence in the city of Weimar and basically became the chief musician in Weimar. Duke Carl Alexander uh, invited him to uh, reside in Weimar uh, because Carl Alexander wanted to make the city of Weimar sort of the Athens of the North, as it were. And Liszt was very, very attracted to this. When you stop and think about the idea that someone would give up a, a performing career at age 35 to do something else. This is rather remarkable. And I do think that it had something to do with the fact that in the background, his Catholic faith was always sort of asserting itself in various ways, primarily through his music. It seems almost like he was haunted by this specter that he just couldn't quite shake. And uh, yep. like a man hunted by God's grace. I think, for example, Francis mm -hmm. Thompson's poem, The Hound of Heaven, I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind and in the midst of tears. I hid from him in under running laughter, etc. Mm -hmm. You know, um, List couldn't escape God's hunt for him. So can you describe for us the series of events later in his life that really transformed the path his life took? Sure, of course. He was already in this period of traveling virtuosity, though, producing works of a very, very Catholic nature. And there were some early choral motets that he wrote. As well, his piano music began to take on this sort of evocative aspect of spirituality. And some of the kernels of his music that later on really blossomed uh, during the Weimar period began in uh, the 1830s. Some of the more uh, famous pieces would be um, the set of piano works called Harmonie Poetic et Religieuse, which included a piano version of a choral work that was an Ave Maria, and there's a Paternoster, as well as the most famous is the, the Benediction of God in Solitude. Mm -hmm. 
which is one of his great piano pieces. Yeah, really a sublime piece. Absolutely. And it was, you know, it was inspired by religious poetry. Um, and it's written in the key of F sharp, which for Liszt was the key of religious contemplation. Some of his most famous works that have a religious theme to them are written in F sharp major. He was very much aware of how different keys in music could evoke different kinds of affectations. For example, in Liszt's music, uh, the key of F minor is the key of mourning. And if you think about the funerai from the same set of pieces mm -hmm. that I referred to, that uh, was written to commemorate the failed Hungarian revolution and the execution of the 13 generals and prime minister in 1849. A lot of people think that that was actually written upon Chopin's death. But as it turns out, it was probably he had heard about the execution and he wrote this piece, the piece that he wrote after the death of Blondine, the variations on a theme by Bach on Wein und Klagen, was written in F minor. So F minor was a key of mourning. D minor was the key of judgment. The uh, Dante Sonata from the second years of pilgrimage is written in the key of D minor. The key of E major is a key of prayer. The key of A flat is the key of human love. And you can go on and on and show many, many different examples of just how his compositional techniques were influenced by his religious faith, by his human experiences. But of course, he went to Weimar. His long-term relationship with Marie de Gaulle had fallen apart. And in the meantime, he had met Princess Caroline Zane Wittgenstein Ivanovska, who was married to a Russian aristocrat. And uh, they met while Liszt was on tour in Russia, and there was an immediate uh, connection. She, of course, was not happy in, in her marriage and ultimately left and ended up taking up residence with Liszt in Weimar at the Altenburg, which was the house, actually rather large grand mansion almost, where uh, Liszt took up residence. It was at that point that Liszt really began to revisit his Catholic faith, and a lot of the great works uh, began to flow from him uh, that have uh, religious connotations to him. Of course, that period of Weimar lasted, oh, from 1847 up until the early 1860s. And they tried to get married. Of course, this would require the annulment from the church. And that is quite the saga. And it was a, a very, very time, a great deal of suffering for him and for Caroline, too. Of course, Weimar was primarily a Lutheran city, and uh, there were not many Catholics in the city at the time. And, of course, the prominent civic leaders in Weimar, being all Lutheran, number one, were a little put off by the fact that not only was he a Catholic, but he was, you know, shacking up with that woman up there at the Altaberg. And so she was a persona non grata in Weimar. He really couldn't show her face in public too much without ridicule and scorn. And Liszt did his best to protect her, but he, you know, at some points was unable to, and there were times where she was, you know, exposed to public ridicule. So she pretty much stayed away from the town. That and then the death of his daughter Blandine were both, I think, issues in his life which really kind of led him down a real path of suffering and may have been used to lead him to ultimately take on a more active role in, in his Catholic faith on several levels. Right. So, I mean, these things combined all kind of in a sort of picturesque moment of God's grace in his life. And mm -hmm. But I, I think of Liszt's life as a particularly poignant witness to the Catholic Church's teaching on the indissolubility of marriage, you know, mm -hmm. that they apply for this annulment, um, Princess Caroline, and it's not granted. And mm -hmm. instead of just doing whatever they wanted to, it mm -hmm. presents a real crisis of conscience, and they end up yeah. going their own ways. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. a, a real witness for our own time that mm -hmm. proclaiming that marriage is forever can lead to conversion, even in very difficult situations when someone would want to go contrary to the church's teaching. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. The saga of uh, the annulment uh, process was extraordinarily dramatic and was really a roller coaster ride emotionally for the both of them. A little bit of background. In Russia, one of the sort of cultural rituals that occurred during the marriage ceremony was that the father of the bride at one point would simply slap the face 
of the bride. And the reason for that is that if at some point the husband were abusive, uh, if the husband were unfaithful, if the you know the circumstances of the marriage were ensuing marriage, I guess I should say were were ugly, that slap indicated that this marriage was entered into under coercion, that the bride was coerced. And this happened, of course, in Princess Caroline's marriage to the Ivanovskas, the, the Ivanovska family. And of course, there was a lot of money involved. The estates were quite grand. And the annulment saga has quite a bit of intrigue to it and even involved Cardinal Hohenlohe who, interestingly enough, uh, was the final intervener, as, as it were, to stop the annulment process from going forward, because it actually had been provisionally granted, and they had actually set their wedding date for October, of one of the early years of the 1860s. They were actually almost on their way to the altar, and Cardinal Hohenlohe intervened to put a stop to it, and the annulment did not go through. Of course, this really did cause the two of them to not proceed which they could have done, and they didn't. And part of the reason, I think, is, is that they were both so emotionally exhausted by uh, the trauma involved in trying to become married. And Liszt wanted it to be done right uh, within the good graces of the church. And he longed for her to be his wife in holy matrimony, and he wanted to take the sacrament seriously. It was just too much and so they parted ways in terms of their romantic relationship, but they remained very, very close to the end of his days. As a matter of fact, she was probably a, an editor of his prose, which sometimes got him into real trouble. But she, she took up residence in Rome and lived basically in a very, very shrouded and dark living space. And she was already rather eccentric, but became even more so. But she had deep correspondence with uh, the Holy Father. Uh, she was very well versed in theology. So Liszt himself took up the pen, for example, to defend the decisions of the Vatican I Council. And she probably was the editor to make sure that what he was saying was actually correct. Uh, she was not a canonist, but she did know quite a bit about canon law. So many people might not be aware of Liszt's final years that you're moving into now. When he moved to Rome, he had a deep friendship with Pope Pius IX. He yep. took up residence in a monastery. He received four minor orders, porter, lector, mm -hmm. exorcist, and acolyte. He was yes. even a third order Franciscan. Yep. So can you describe for us what that part of his life was focused on. Sure. When he was in Rome, he took up residence in the Madonna del Rosario convent or monastery, which Dr. Walker talks about trying to get into in the modern era because it is now run by cloistered nuns. And so it, it was quite uh, difficult to get into the Madonna del Rosario. But he finally was able to do it and, and to go into the, uh, the cell where Liszt resided. But Liszt spent lots of time in quiet contemplation. And of course, this is where he produced his grand oratory on the life of Christ called Christus, as well as uh, many other of his large-scale religious works, um, the Canticle of the, to the Son, based on the text of St. Francis of Assisi. I think that life in the monastery was very, very helpful to him, but he didn't stay there permanently. In fact, he toured basically four months in each of three places, Rome, and then in Budapest, and then in Weimar. And each year, he would go back between these three places. He did take the minor orders, and he wore a cassock and the round-brimmed black hat. And there are several wonderful silhouettes of him. Yeah, <laughs> I love those photos. In that of him. And he was known as Abe List from that time on. His time in, in both Budapest and Weimar were largely teaching. He had a tremendous group of students who influenced piano teaching and piano performance 
all the way into the 20th century. As a matter of fact, I would speculate that both you and I as pianists in our training studied with people who studied with people who studied with people who studied with Liszt, who studied with Czerny, who studied with Beethoven. Uh, (laughs) So it's a very, very interesting pedigree. He was also very, very much interested in uh, philanthropic causes, including uh, the formation of what became known as the Liszt Academy in Budapest. I guess I should say that really during his years of uh, virtuoso traveling back in the 1830s and and early 40s, he was constantly raising money for hospitals, orphanages, for uh, schools, flood victims. And so the social teaching of the Catholic Church was never, ever far from his mind. And as uh, Dr. Walker likes to say, a river of gold flowed in, but a river of gold also (laughs) flowed out. (laughs) And he was very, very much uh, influenced by that. Uh, he was also influenced by this movement of what became known as St. Simonism, uh, Simonism, uh, which was really a, a Catholic social movement in, in Paris and Europe during that time. Anyway, some of his other works that came from his pen during this last period of his life were the, uh, the Oratorio St. Elizabeth, based on the life of St. Elizabeth of Hungary. He wrote a lot of choral music, fantastic works that I think are unjustly neglected. Right, and many of them usable in the sacred liturgy, right? Absolutely. Uh, I'll give you an example. There's an O Salutaris Ostia, number two, uh, which is very short. It's very, very beautiful. It's four part. It has a very small organ accompaniment that appears at times, and I've used that O Salutaris Ostia with the cathedral choir at St. Mary's Cathedral in Fargo, where I'm uh, director of music. And it is a lovely piece and really perfect for example, a post-communion meditation or, or something of that sort. He wrote a fabulous Ave Maria, which I think is glorious and, and should be more widely accepted. He wrote requiems. He wrote masses. He wrote a, a couple of large-scale masses, including the Hungarian coronation mass, which was written upon the ascension of, now the name escapes me, I'm sorry, but one of the Habsburg monarchs that he wrote the coronation mass for. He wrote a Misa Corrales. He also wrote a, uh, a setting of the Stations of the Cross, the Via Crucis, which is quite a remarkable piece. And because it was later in his life, it's a little bit more harmonically sparse and not quite the romantic sentiment that we oftentimes associate with his music. Right. It doesn't sound like the Hungarian Rhapsody, but set for voices. <laughs> no, 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 it doesn't. But very, very, very moving. As a matter of fact, I first heard a performance of that at a list festival at uh, your uh, one of your alma maters, the uh, University of Nebraska Lincoln. It was absolutely a wonderful performance of that, that particular work. He also was pretty constant in attending daily mass. And he was extraordinarily generous with his students. He believed in a concept that we knew or know as noblesse oblige, that nobility has obligations. Well, he coined a phrase, genie oblige, genius has obligations. (laughs) (laughs) And he really took that seriously, especially in his teaching. And he was very generous with his students. He did not charge a penny. He felt that he had to give back what he had been given. So he spent lots of time teaching students. Of course, it was in what we call the master class setting where all of the students are together and one student would come to the piano and and would play and then Liszt would give them hints and coaching and stuff. During this life of his, after he became uh, known as Abbe Liszt, He ventured between these three uh, areas, Rome, Weimar, and Budapest. He taught, he composed, he wrote prose about his Catholic faith. He was one of the first what we might call ethnomusicologists because he, with good intention, tried to gather together Hungarian folk music and to catalog it and then to to present, you know, analysis of it, uh, which got him into huge trouble because a lot of the folk tunes that he claimed were Hungarian were actually from the Romani rather than the Hungarians. And this got him crossways with the Hungarian patriots of the day. But nonetheless, I, I think his heart was in the right place. Thank you for giving us this wonderful picture of the Catholic list rather than the 
picture that's so often presented as, you know, just the rock star list and for clarifying some of those misunderstandings of his life and personality. You've mentioned the book by Dr. Walker. If our listeners want to read more of this definitive biography, could you tell us uh, more about the book? Yeah, it's actually in three volumes. The three volumes are List the Virtuoso Years, List the Weimar Years, and List the Final Years. And the reading is captivating. Uh, It's almost like reading a novel because Dr. Walker's prose and his ability to lay out the life is quite remarkable. Now, it's 1,500 pages. So in three (laughs) volumes, you got a lot of reading. You really want to learn more about List. uh, Listen, I didn't want to put the book down each volume as it came out. I said, wow, this is amazing. Now, interestingly enough, as a side note, last fall, his 800-page biography of Chopin came out. And it is a magnificent read, too. He really gets down into the weeds about List's life, his existence, the relationship between his existence and his music, and about the music itself and how the music was influenced by so many aspects of List's life. Of course, I I would have to um, mention, too, that his uh, final days and final years were quite tragic. uh, And his music reflects this. The late music of List really portends the dissolution of tonality. And he really sort of preceded what musicologists call the second Viennese school, where tonality went out the window in some of these pieces. But interestingly enough, some of those late pieces are indeed religious pieces. Sursum Corda, the the Jadot à la Villa d'Esta from the the third year of pilgrimage, that these pieces really do capture that List's faith was still going strong. Sancta Maria, Sancta Dortia. He was very, very much always in touch with the Catholic side of his faith. It's a complicated life and a life worth learning and reading about. And then ultimately listening to the music, I think, is, of course. is incredible. And I think one of my own personal favorite pieces is the uh, Oratorio of St. Elizabeth of Hungary. It's almost a three-hour oratorio, and in my own opinion, could be staged as an opera. It's so operatic uh, in its conception, but uh, List sort of frowned on that sort of thing because that actually came up. Why don't we do this as an opera? And he said, no, 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 it's an oratorio. (laughs) But now that he's gone, I think somebody should try it sometime. (laughs) Another oratory that was uncompleted was St. Stanislaus, and uh, that was recorded not too long ago by uh, the conductor James Conlon, an absolutely wonderful piece. So anyway, List's life is interesting, and I always, I I return to his music and his life time and time again. And now that I'm a Catholic, it becomes even more meaningful and interesting. Right. So that wraps up this episode talking about List, but it launches us for a future episode in talking about your own conversion to Catholicism. So thank you for joining us talking about lists today. It was really fascinating. Absolutely my pleasure, Jennifer. Thank you so much. If you're interested in learning more about Franz List, check out the website of the American List Society. It's AmericanListSociety.net. And of course, List is spelled L-I-S-Z-T. And you can also get a link to Dr. Walker's important biography about List in our show notes page. We'll also link to Dr. Hirschberger's faculty page from Concordia University in Moorhead, Minnesota. And until our next episode, may we sing the praise of his glory. We hope you've enjoyed listening to Square Notes, the sacred music podcast with Peter Carter and Dr. Jennifer Donaldson. For more information about this episode, sacred music resources, or upcoming events, visit our website at sacredmusicpodcast.com. You can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, SoundCloud, or your favorite podcast app. If you enjoy our podcast, please write us a review on iTunes. This improves our iTunes ranking and helps others find out about the podcast. The music you heard at the beginning of this episode is Heck Dies by William Byrd, sung by the London Oratory Schola Cantorum Boys Choir, directed by Charles Cole, from the CD Sacred Treasures of England. The music at the conclusion of this podcast is the first movement of Trio Sonata No. 6 in G Major by Johann Sebastian Bach, performed by Peter Carter. We look forward to having you join us next time, and until then, may we sing the praise of His glory. <laughs>